Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual. My guest today is Moises Naim, former cabinet minister in Venezuela, acclaimed columnist in the world's leading newspapers, including in Spain and throughout Latin America, editor of foreign policy magazine for 14 years, and one of only three distinguished fellows at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. His most recent book published in 2022 is called The Revenge of Power, How Autocrats Are Reinventing Politics for the 21st Century. Moises, it's a great privilege to have you on our platform today. Welcome to South Africa, at least online. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much for the invitation. Delighted to be with you and all your friends and our friends online. Great. Well, let me start by asking, why did you write this book? Ten years ago, I wrote a book called the, ti the title was The End of Power. And it argued that in every human activity where power matters, power was weakening. Not that it disappeared, but it was weakening. But power at the same time had become easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. It became more ephemeral. And again, that happened in every country, and in every industry, in every sector. Uh, and it, it was a trend. It was a global trend that was with us. That was 10 years ago. Uh, and, and what happened in those 10 years is that we saw um, a decline of democracy. We saw new tricks uh, and strategies and uh, tactics used by those who had power to avoid, contain, uh, dilute the forces that were weakening power. And so the way they did it was by using strategies that I call the three Ps, uh, populism, polarization, and post-truth. Those uh, strategies help them stay in power, retain power, conquer power. And each of them uh, is well known, but they all have acquired new potency in the 21st century, accelerated by globalization, by technology, uh, social media, and everything else that uh, I know we're going to be talking a bit uh, about uh, that. Well, you, you made a very strong assertion in one of your articles where you said that there is a crisis in the sustainability of democratic government on a scale not seen since the rise of fascists across Europe in the 1930s. Can you explain why you're going this far in your your view of the decline or attacks on democracy? Because I have the numbers and the statistics on my side of the argument. Uh, there is an organization called Variety of Democracy that operates out of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. They measure uh, the, variety, the V democracy, variety of democracies. They measure the different ways in which the autocracy can be manifested. They just issued their most recent report for this year. And just let me read you uh, some of the things that the report says. Advances in global levels of democracy made over the last 35 years have been wiped out. 72% of the world population, that is 5.7 billion people, live in autocracies by uh, 2022. The level of uh, democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2022 is down to 1966, 1986 levels. The decline is more dramatic in the Asia Pacific region, which is back to levels last recorded, recorded in 1978. Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean are back to levels last seen around the end of the Cold War. And I can go on, and they have very a lot of details. Um, the, the central story here is that the average citizen of the world today at least 72% uh, of, of, of those live in countries where their freedom, their liberties, their civil liberties are curtailed or do not exist. So is, is India still on the democratic side in those tables? 
Well, it, again, it, it is a range, uh, it, but that's why they call it variety of democracies. I think they make the very good point that, that there is not such a thing that a pure autocracy and a pure democracy, it is a range and is a continuum. And, and they have a very sophisticated methodology to, quali to put countries in, in, in different places. And India, of course, is highly problematic, is the largest democracy in the world. But in recent years, we have seen how also some the checks and balances that define a democracy have been under attack in India. Hmm. Hmm. So what exactly is different about the new autocrats? How do you see this? It's very interesting, and because these are leaders that, uh, that have uh, essentially anti-democratic propensity that they know how to hide. Uh, one of the characteristics of the, of the uh, new autocrats is that uh, they know how to play the game. They know how to use uh, social media technologies, uh, global trends of the different kinds of economy just to appear uh, uh, democratic, but in fact, they are propending and tending towards uh, uh, autocracy. Uh, in the past, all you needed to do is get a general, give him some dark glasses and go on television and say, my, my tanks are on the streets and my fighter bombing bomber planes are in the sky, I, I'm in charge. You know, the typically military uh, coup in which, uh, uh, again, the, the military and the armed forces were the main protagonists. That's not what we see now. What we see is a very sophisticated use of stealth and uh, double talk and propaganda manipulation uh, that hides uh, the fact that uh, all these autocrats are undermining checks and balances from within. Many of them have arrived to power through ele elections, uh, some more... Uh, uh, transparent and valid than others and legitimate. But uh, once they are in government uh, and democratically or semi-democratically elected, they start undermining uh, democracy by eliminating uh, checks and balances, by diluting the Supreme Court, the, the main tribunal, by limiting and buying uh, the, the members of Congress, uh, by, by essentially co-opting, cajoling, recruiting, incentivizing, uh, those that operate uh, and are, uh, you know, the, 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 the pillars of the of this, uh, checks and balances that uh, are these institutions, of course. I liked your line where you said we have less democracy, but more elections. Um, it's very true. Uh, That's a surprise. And I was looking at numbers and, you know, the elections are booming. As we speak, I'm sure that if we look, we will find that somewhere in the world there is an election taking place. It may be for state and local government, or it can be for head of the state, head of state. But again, uh, voting seems to be fashionable. But then uh, at the same time, we, as, as I just mentioned the numbers, democracy is undergoing a massive attack. And most of the people in the world today don't live in the democracy. So why are populist autocrats so popular? Why do so many people in so many different countries like them so much? Has democracy really failed them? Yeah, well, yes, in many ways, but you know, they are uh, they they know how to play the game. They know to uh, they know what their people want. Uh, and they know how to promise uh, to achieve it, but then they have a difficult time doing that and they have to rely on the three Ps. What's happening, Anne, is that worldwide, uh, government performance has declined, has been declining. Governments are not delivering to the citizens, to their voters, what they promise. And so if you don't, if you don't have performance, high performance to it, that, that legitimizes your power and allows you to stay in power, uh, then you have to resource to the 3P. Then you start using manipulation. Uh, and the 3Ps, again, is populism, post-truth and polarization. So you start polarizing the country and just trying to govern with a, with a sliver, but that is enough to give you control of, of the electoral process, for example. Um, and, and, and in essence, uh, trying to bypass democracy or look by looking like an active democracy where elections are held uh, you know, very, very often, but they are very often uh, tricked. And, uh, and in other cases are just manipulated and uh, people are voting for candidates that will never deliver on the promises that they made in the campaign. So, so the real issues that populists build on, um, why are governments delivering less and 
Democrats or democratic leaders kind of making promises they don't deliver on? Well, what's what's because that's the, that's the way to legitimize. Uh, you know, the, 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 there is a dearth of uh, uh, legitimacy in the world today. Uh, because, the, you know, the legitimacy comes from the origin of your power or by your performance. And in both cases, those are not delivering enough. So they have to come up with other ways. And again, I argue and I, I think a lot of data shows that the preferred kinds of tools are the strategies around the three Ps. Right. So let's talk about the second P of polarization, which seems different now. Is it really different? Um, and what is the role of the internet in all of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, polarization, the three P's have always existed. Populism have always existed, polarization and post-truth, we used to call it uh, propaganda. Now we call it post-truth. Uh, but what you ask, what is it uh, that, uh, you know, the polarization has become so intense and so paralyzing and so, so really unhealthy in, in so many ways? Well, because it's the way to find, in, again, you don't want to win by a majority because uh, landslides are just now things of the past because the countries are so fragmented that nobody, very infrequently, um, the result of an election is a landslide that gives a clear mandate to a candidate. More of what we see is uh, uh, multiple factions, uh, you know, fighting for a small sliver of government. Some governments uh, look at the, uh, Spain, look at Israel. They have to go to elections very often uh, because they, they they lack the the legitimacy of, of in, in a variety of ways. And and so what happens is you ask about uh, um, both populism and polarization. Polarization has always existed, but now it has a very powerful ally, which is the third P, uh, post-truth, which is essentially creating an environment using new technologies of communications and, and, and manipulation of opinion, feelings uh, that, uh, that, uh, that amplify the polarization. So what you want, if you're running one thing, you want to create chaos, uh, doubts, disappointment, resentment, and then through that, you assemble, you cobble a coalition that, uh, that gets you to the presidential palace. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> I'll come back. So would you be in favor of curbing the internet, stronger rules? How do you see that and freedom of expression? No, I am a Democrat and I'm always for more freedom rather than less. Uh, I do believe that we are uh, we we have been dealing with the information revolution and all what we have seen in the internet in a way that is um, not sufficient. In the past, when we had the other big revolution, the industrial revolution, uh, years later uh, around the world, countries started creating uh, consumer protection agencies that protected citizens from the malpractices and the abuses of the private sector. Of, of, defective products and unreliable service or all of that. So consumer protection was a thing and it was very important. But we don't, there is one technology that we use from the beginning in the morning to the night, in tonight, you know, is a, is a digital, we are the consumers of digital products all day, every day, constantly. And yet we don't have any consumer protection of the digital consumer. And so I think we are gonna see more of that. Uh, we are gonna see also uh, the companies. Companies will, the, 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 there is a, a strong incentive to develop tools that allow people like you and me and, and others that we're watching to be better protected, to, to have some kind of defense from the manipulation that we are subject to on a daily basis. So let's dig a big, bit deeper into post-truth. Um, you said, Post-truth is not about the spread of this lie or that lie, but it's about destroying the possibility of truth in public life. Tell us about that a bit more. Let's dig well, a bit more. Yeah, it's very interesting. In the past, we used to call this propaganda. The governments, every government use advertising and propaganda, literally, uh, to advance political ideas and uh, attack uh, the, the rivals and all of that. So, but propaganda at that time was essentially an institutional thing by governments. 
what we now have is highly individualistic often uh, initiative taken by individuals uh, that then become uh, uh, these, you know, spreaders of, uh, of messages. Very often those messages are not truth. Very often those messages, what they look to do is to create confusion, intolerance, uh, hatred even. And, uh, and so that's this. And, and again, uh, uh, the polarization has been greatly, greatly amplified by the spread and the, uh, the popularization of uh, the tools that underpin the uh, post-truth. Meaning, essentially, they don't want to, to, as I said before, they're not looking for a landslide because they know that they cannot get it, but they can get confusion. They can get discord. They, they thrive where there is discord and confusion. And all of that, they can do it stealthily. You can bet that the Kremlin continues to uh, it, it, it try to influence politics around the world. That's uh, something they have learned how to do and they're continuing to do it. Sorry, so let me push back a little bit and say, perhaps we exaggerate some of these new developments. After all, countries like China or Russia, are uh, they rule their citizens by fear in many respects. China delivers or has delivered, but there's also enormous fear of the police and crackdown. So dissidents are jailed and the police are present in all sorts of ways. Isn't that more important perhaps than some of the other things you're mentioning? Except, yeah, uh, uh, it, it is very important. Uh, and when you have, we recently heard uh, a case in Russia in which a young woman was just uh, writing comments that were critical of the war. She now uh, was uh, tried and is going to be sent to jail for a very long time. So as you, as you say correctly, this is brutal. This is definitive. This is, uh, you know, goes beyond the niceties of... Um, you know, political discourse to go into the brutal behavior of a police state. The same happens in, in China, of course, that has one of the most sophisticated tra tracking system and social uh, control system. But even there, and you see that it no, not only works, they were very adamant in trying to limit the, the and, and shape the conversation around the, fa the failure in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they they did not do a good job. They, they, they are very sec secretive, but even there, it became obvious that uh, things were not going well. And people online were protesting. And the government, uh, the Chinese government, that has perhaps the world's most powerful tool of social control through the internet, could, couldn't control it, simply couldn't control it. Um, and that's something that to which the government in Beijing is very sensitive. They know that they live in a country that if it gets destabilized, it's going to be very, very hard to stabilize again. Hmm. Hmm. Let me move to a related but different topic. Um, you've thought a lot about corruption and international criminal syndicates. Tell us about Russia and the international crime and international politics. What do we need to know as citizens of another country? Well, uh, you need to know that this is not happening in Russia only, but it's a global trend where uh, organized crime is not outside the government trying to influence the government, but uh, organized crime is the government. Uh, that different in different countries, you see that the, uh, our, our organized crimes and mafias and uh, the transnational criminal networks are used as an instrument of state, uh, are used by the government uh, uh, to advance its goals, to punish its rivals, to eliminate threats, to concentrate power. And we have seen it around the world. Um, uh, and this is not corruption. Uh, you know, we have always had corruption uh, and, uh, and it's part of the story. And I know that we're gonna talk a little bit about that too. But uh, the point, my point essentially is that we are no longer a, in the space of uh, in which, you know, crime has always existed as part of, you know, the human condition comes with crime in many, you know, crime is always there, therefore there's nothing new under, under the sun. I wrote a book that titled Illicit, 
that show that that's not true. There is a lot new under the sun that is uh, projecting and uh, the kind of power that used to be in the, in the private sector or in politics to, uh, to be controlled by uh, uh, cr criminal syndicates. So, so take us into a bit more detail about, you know, I have friends who joke that a lot of the people one's engaging with on social media are actually bots from Russia uh, or China. Um, is this true? Are there real factories manufacturing bots, influencing public discussion in Europe, in America, in South Africa and elsewhere? You can bet that wherever there is an election, there is someone op operating social media and bots and, 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 and now with uh, the new technology for artificial intelligence that it, it will be trying to influence the situation. Uh, there is no doubt that, uh, that there is a, a strong element uh, of, uh, of, of criminal organization uh, around uh, the use of bots and uh, the technologies, um, you know, the information technologies and social media that are at the ser are being used at the service of uh, the, the, the autocrats. Hmm. Hmm. You've written about different kinds of corruption. You've said there's normal corruption, there's kleptocracy, and then there are mafia states. Let's start with the first two. Um, what's the difference between normal corruption and kleptocracy in public life? So normal corruption has always existed. It's transactional. Uh, sometimes it's just the traffic officer that uh, is willing not to give you a ticket uh, in exchange for a bribe uh, or the minister that collects 10% of uh, the highway costs uh, or the, you know, it's, it is, it's based on a transaction. Very often it's based on public servants uh, interacting with people in the private sector. And, um, uh, and together they create a condition in which the public servant uh, uh, makes money. So th that's the transactional, historic, uh, normal, quote unquote, corruption. Then there's another one that is called kleptocratic in which they don't bother to have the, 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 any, any highway or anything. They just uh, you know, put the, they, they take the money from the state and the kleptocrats use um, the, the government public funds to, for, to enrich themselves, their families, their cronies, the military and so on. And there is not a, tr a specific transaction, but there is a, you know, the control of the, of the public sector, of public funds and all the economic activities of the country are, are put as subservient and, and, and work in support of the kleptocrats um, that uh, are essentially the stealing the their resources of the nation. Mm. And then um, there is a third. So one is transactional, quote unquote, normal. The second is kleptocratic. And the third is mafia states, which is I described before. Uh, they are uh, they are the state. It's not that they are outside the state influencing those in government. It's that they are the government. Governments become uh, mafia organizations, mafia-like organizations, and they control them and they take control of them, not to uh, eliminate them and stamp them out uh, in favor of society, but put them to work for them. So let me I've always been puzzled as to why you go to a place like Italy, where you read about a lot of corruption and the mafia and so on, but the highways are terrific. Whereas in some other countries, in Africa and elsewhere, there's a lot of corruption, but actually the highway never gets built. What, what how does this work? Again, uh, there is a continuum, right? Is the outer, you know, is it just taking over and putting your hands in the tiller of the nation, uh, or trying to pretend that, that something is being done? Italy has a very unhealthy political system that has not been able to deliver uh, the kind of sustained, uh, stable government, and uh, and and yes, uh, the but Italy is also. <laughs> Italy has seen there was a very significant uh, uh, accident uh, with a bridge near Genova that, that essentially fell. 
and, and they, uh, you know, and, and that too had a lot to do with corruption and the way in which things are built and, uh, and, 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 the, and all that. So, but again, there is a corruption in which there is uh, people that just take 10% of whatever the public work is uh, or the supplies in the pu public sector uh, and take it and others and take it all. So the, it's, it's a continuum. Hmm. So once a country gets captured by or becomes a mafia state. Um, you, you, you mentioned somebody in Bulgaria, the intelligence chief of Bulgaria or the former intelligence chief who said that other countries have the mafia in Bulgaria, the mafia has the country. Once you're in that kind of situation, how do you change the culture? How do you come back from that? Well, first understand uh, that there are no silver bullets. There is not a one-liner to solve the problem, but no problem will ever be solved if it's not recognized first and, uh, and, uh, and deeply in, in, in its roots and everything else. And this is not something that any single individual can do alone. This has to be a national purpose. This has to be a government that knows how to persuade the population that living like this uh, is this unsustainable and acceptable and create a, a, a national uh, coalition against this that includes the private sector, the military, the churches, uh, the universities, the journalists, uh, academics, uh, movie makers, all of that, uh, that works uh, in favor of, uh, again, it may not be possible to eradicate completely corruption, but there are ways in which you can contain the most egregious uh, presence of, 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 of the criminals shaping the, the, the realities of the whole nation. Do you know of countries that have come back from being in mafia states? Are there examples? Well, they, they were, there is an, a good example. Uh, uh, Colombia uh, is, is an example. Colombia was never a mafia state, properly said, in, in, in this way, which the government is the mafia. Is, is, is a criminal syndicate. Uh, Colombia has always had the possibility of uh, protecting their governments from the inroads of the mafia of the organized crime. But uh, Colombia is one of the world's um, biggest suppliers of uh, narcotics. So that goes together with being uh, a, a mafia state without still taking control of the government. But Colombia has made many advances in the fight against uh, narco trafficking and narco traffickers. And again, they did it by creating a coalition um, that, uh, that, that fights for that. And I think there's an example there. Without saying that you know, problems in Colombia have disappeared, they continue to have problems. But uh, Colombia has uh, many examples uh, that uh, one can look at to see how it, they can be applied somewhere else. Hmm. Let's, let's talk a bit about America. Um, let me start with the extent to which, in your view and from your work, to what extent did Russia promote Trump or help Trump get elected? Is there again, evidence found on this? Again, it's not my opinion, it's the, 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 it's the data, it's the statistics. 17 intelligence agencies of the United States uh, created, uh, produced a document uh, uh, that essentially stated that uh, the, Russia had a major influence uh, in the elections in the United States. Um, and uh, that has not been uh, denied or, you know, declared. Uh, uh, it seems to be true. And again, it sounds easy, but uh, making 17 different, uh, uh, you know, intelligence services work together is not easy. Um, mm. So that consensus tells you that there is a, a very powerful set of data that points in the direction of Russia having intervened in the American elections. Um, there are also interesting studies in which you, you people have discovered, for example, that Russia and the boss, you know, again, this is not done directly clumsily through the government and the Kremlin. This is done through intermediaries to bots, to technologies that mask and hide who is behind um, these initiatives. But, you know, there are also countermeasures that are uh, available to discover who is meddling with elections. And we have seen that in Mexico, for example, we have seen it in quite amazing in Spain when there was the, all the debates about Catalonia, 
um, Catalonia in Spanish. Uh, they, they, the presence of, the, of, of foreign uh, powers intervening and shaping the elections was also well docu documented. So you can say that it's, it was quite an easy uh, and difficult uh, to have uh, uh, to have a, a kind of an election and not uh, and not having the interference of foreign powers. The last American election, there seemed to be less, or people said there was less interference. Has America got better at combating international yes. powers interfering in elections? Well, they will tell you, the experts on that, they tell you we are doing much better in the United States than we was a, the case between the, the election that uh, Donald Trump won. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of uh, public funding for uh, developing protections and uh, 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 safeguarding the integrity of the electoral process. And then moving forward, they're still not, uh, where are, not, not where they should be. They're still, you know, always running behind uh, the advances and innovations of, uh, of the bad actors. Mm. Mm. And, and which are the main countries that are doing this? We've talked a bit about Russia, but China, which are the main countries that are using artificial intelligence and the internet and so on to interfere in other countries, do you think? There are many, uh, and I think, you know, it's, it depends on uh, many definitions, but surely ones that have uh, that actively engaged in these kinds of things are examples uh, I can give you is North Korea is surely there. Iran is, is there. Uh, I, we know that Russia is there. Um, but, uh, you know, on the other side, you have to assume that both the United States, uh, European Union, uh, Japan, uh, and others are also actively developing the technological wherewithal um, to, to, to play this game. Hmm. Let me turn to another subject entirely. Um, you are Venezuelan. You were involved in the government before Chavez took over. There's some people in South Africa that admire Chavez. Um, could you tell us in some, we've got quite a lot of time, tell us the story of Venezuela as you experienced it, what happened, the story of Chavez and how a society has been so decimated by, by the choices that were made, if I can put it that way. It's a long, painful story, and um, I, I wrote a novel, a novel about this. I felt it was so complex that I needed to use the tools of fiction to tell the story of what really happened. The novel, for those who are interested, is in English uh, also, uh, and it's called Two Spies in Caracas. And uh, through the life, one of the spies is a, is a CIA woman agent, and the other is a Cuban uh, spy. And they are both uh, trying to contain the influence of uh, either Cuba or the United States. And then that tells the story of what happened to the country. Um, it is wrong to uh, explain what happened in Venezuela uh, well, in, in terms of what other countries like Venezuela. Venezuela is an oil country, it's a petrostate. And people blame being a petrostate and being full of uh, that kind of money as a reason of why it imploded. And of course that doesn't hold water because many countries are oil countries and have not seen the, the scale of the debacle, uh, the, the collapse of an entire nation. Seven, Venezuela has 27 to 30 million people and seven million just walked, re literally walked uh, to leave uh, the horrors of living in Venezuela today. So Venezuela is a fi failure, is a collapsing, it's not even a failed state, it's a, it's a drastically collapsing uh, nation that, where the government plays very limited roles uh, in, and it just controls the army, the intelligence services and so on, um, the oil industry. Um, but the rest, you know, is not a government that can provide public services to the citizens. Uh, so it, 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 it was not oil, um, uh, it was not uh, uh, ideology does not work to explain it because we have seen 
you know, no, the notion that this is socialism. Well, there was elements of socialism, but this is kleptocracy to the ninth uh, level. You know, it's, it's uh, so. Mm. I can go on for a long time, but I would rather have people reading my novel. Everything is there. <laughs> well, let me phrase it a different way. Are there lessons South Africa and other countries might learn of what not to do from the, the rise of Chavez and what happened? Uh, to a limit, because in Venezuela, you know, the presence of oil is, was very important and shaped uh, politics in very important ways. Uh, and uh, they influenced the Cuban government. Uh, Fidel Castro developed a strong emotional relationship with Hugo Chavez. And uh, Hugo Chavez was able to do whatever he wanted. He had the money because at, this, at that time, the prices of oil were very high. So he had a lot of money and he started funding a lot of initiatives, including in South Africa. Uh, and, uh, and so they, and, and he opened the door to, um, to Fidel Castro. And Cubans, uh, uh, the intelligence services of, of Cuba run a lot and make decisions, very important decisions in Venezuela were made and continue to be made by a foreign invader. Uh, Venezuela is not just a petro state, but is an occupied uh, state, is occupied by a foreign po power, which is Cuba, that um, has veto power so, over all the decisions that is, uh, has benefited immensely from uh, uh, essentially looting Venezuela and, and, and taking um, oh, many of the riches of Venezuela out to Cuba. Again, a long story, but a sad one. Mm. Must be very hard. Um, let me turn to hopefully a, a more positive topic. Since you wrote your book, I imagine late 2021 and then published in 2022, a, a lot has happened that, that we could interpret positively. Mr. Trump was defeated in a democratic election. Bolsonaro was, was defeated in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro. Um, and many democracies have united in opposition to the invasion of Ukraine. Are, are you, what is your, are you more optimistic than you were? at the beginning of writing your book, or can we see some signs of hope for democracy in the late the recent events? Yes and no. Uh, yes, uh, no, uh, because I go back to the numbers that we I, I, I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, advances, and I quote again, advances in global levels of democracy made over the last 35 years have been wiped out. This is mm. variety of democracy, absolutely reliable kind of sorts. Of, but the same report, has good news. The same report uh, uh, says that uh, the uh, eight of the top 10 democratizing countries, countries that were moving towards democracy over the last 10 years have, are now democracies. So in terms of nation states, uh, there's good news. Four of the top 10 democracies in the short term, uh, three year perspective has transitioned from autocracy to democracy. So it's happening in some countries it's happening. Uh, and that has to give us all the, the initiative, the, the hope, uh, the, 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 you know, the notion that it can be, you know, autocracies can be fought and defeated. Good. Um, do you think Putin made a big mistake in invading Ukraine? Um, or is it too soon to tell? And yes, it is too soon to tell in terms of the ramifications, but the, the, you know, the, the notion that, uh, of course, he made a mistake. I remember, there is a consensus now about the idea that he thought that this was going to be easy. In fact, uh, the, the, you know, the notion was that they, go, they were going straight to Kiev and uh, take over the, the, a nation that was incapable of defending and with armed forces that were smaller and limited than those of Russia, less sophisticated. And it all turned out to be not true. Uh, the Ukrainians would not allow uh, a, a brutal dictator to come and take part of the country. They fought uh, tooth and nails in, in very much more effective ways. You know, the armed forces of Ukraine has shown that to be far better, more effective than the Russians. They, 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 uh, Putin also made something that looked impossible, which was to make uh, Europe act together 
um, and provide um, together with the United States the weapons, uh, advanced technologies and all that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think tr Trump, uh, Putin, of course, uh, disdains and dislikes uh, NATO, uh, but uh, what he did consolidated NATO and made it even a more important, more permanent um, uh, organization. New countries are joining uh, NATO. So everything is going against uh, the interests uh, of, uh, uh, you know, Russia is no longer uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, global player in, uh, in, in, in energy, you know, countries uh, and entire continents are changing uh, the way they, cons they, they procure, consume and pay for uh, oil and gas. And so if you do the list, uh, the list is that despite that in, in addition to the horrors of the way this war is being waged, taking children from the family, thousands of Ukrainian children, have been taken from their families and sent to Russia. You know, that, of course, is a criminal that is in, in, unacceptable. But in addition to that, um, the economy of uh, Russia has been badly hurt. Um, the future of Russia as a, as a superpower is in doubt. And, you know, they have nuclear weapons, and that is a very important consideration. But things are not going as Putin had planned, obviously. Mm. And do you think the democracies dealt with COVID better than non-democratic societies? Is there evidence for that? Is, can we make that assertion now? Everybody is trying to look at that. And that's a very good question. And um, the jury is still out. We have seen uh, democracies that made huge mistakes and it was disastrous. You mentioned Bolsonaro a couple of times in Brazil. Well, Brazil, the way Brazil managed uh, the pandemic was disastrous. And uh, many more Brazilians died because of malpractice at the level of the government. Uh, and, and so, but at the same time, you have other countries that manage quite well um, the pandemic. Uh, uh, surely uh, Australia uh, and, and others, uh, you know, so, so but, but it, there's not a definitive answer. Uh, and um, the jury is still out to decide who did well and the correlation with the uh, type of government, uh, you know, do, do dictators uh, manage, did dictators manage better the, the pandemic than Democrats? We, we don't know that yet. Mm. Let me pick up a question that's on the Q and A. Um, what do you mean when you talk about people have are now, there's a sort of turn towards anti-politics. What does this mean? And what are its implications in domestic politics and also for international relations? How do you see that? Thanks for that. That's a very important question. And um, the, 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 the book, The Revenge of Power, has a whole chapter on, uh, on that, uh, on the notion uh, that, that politics is not delivering. Uh, politicians now in power has to have to go que se vayan todos in Spanish is, you know, throw them all out. And uh, anti-politics is we don't believe in the politicians, we don't believe in the private sectors, in the bankers, in the journalists, in the clerics. clerics. We don't believe in anybody, no, nobody is reliable. Uh, and again, here polarization and feeding polarization also helps. Uh, is anti-politics is not, you know, I don't wanna play by these rules. And that opens the, 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 the space for charlatans, demagogues, uh, that again, come and promise. Uh, that a big example of this is Hugo Chavez, of course. He was the new face that the Venezuelan people wanted because they were fed up with the governments that they had. They wanted more. There's an explosion of uh, demand for better public services, for example. And he did not do much to deliver that. And so the, uh, the, the, all the, the way to do this was to feed polarization and denounce uh, rivals, make them into in a, in illeg illegitimate enemies and all that. And that's part of this, of, of the menu uh, when you have this situation. But uh, the, the whole notion of anti-politics is a very dangerous current because instead of getting, you know, people are hungry, they have an appetite for new faces. 
the newcomers, the people that have not been tainted by being in government or close to government or the centers of powers or have benefited from uh, corrupt regimes, people, there is a huge, huge hunger for decent, honest, competent government. And that's not coming through, you know, so the, what you have, if, given that you don't have that, you cannot satisfy all these high expectations of the people, then you have to rely on populism, on polarization and post-truth. And talk to us about, about your idea of fandom in politics. This was new to me. I hadn't seen it. We, uh, we all know that uh, um, politicians uh, need to be charismatic uh, uh, and there are different ways of being charismatic. This is a, a relationship that politicians need to have with the supporters, with the voters and so on. And, and that was identified and written about, uh, you know, in centuries ago. But now there is a new way of uh, relating to this, which is adopting the behavior of people that are fans of, of, of sports clubs or arts or cultural movements or, you know, where the, the fandom is called, you know, is, is, I, I'm not a follower, I am a fan, absolute fan. And the relationship between the fans and the leader are shaped by emotions, by deep emotions. Silvio Berlusconi in Italy was a master in this and he created, um, he owned a, a, a soccer club and, and the soccer club was also often used uh, to, to promote his politi political uh, objectives. Um, and fans, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the relationship between the, the leaders and the followers uh, is guided by many of the same sentiments, feelings, uh, enthusiasms, passions that you find in people that admire uh, rock, rock stars or, or uh, sports, uh, lead, sports champions. Hmm. I'm a Manchester United fan till I die kind of thing is now yeah, applied yeah. to politics. Yeah, and, you, and it's not rational, it's, it's, a, it's a deeply emotional. So what Berlusconi discovered was that if he could mind, touch, develop, uh, use that powerful feeling of uh, I'm with you because I'm with you, do whatever you want. Uh, Hugo Chavez had also, uh, among his followers, he also had that. Uh, and we see it around the world, highly charismatic uh, leaders uh, that, uh, that, you know, are trying to, contain uh, the, 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 the bad situation. You've been quite critical about sort of, how should I put it, democratic elites or citizens who haven't seen what was happening in their countries by the anti-democrats and haven't stood up, haven't responded to this effectively. Can you talk a little bit about that? The government and the world have a, has a problem uh, of um, of leadership. We don't have, for some reason, our leaders fall short around the world. You're typical. You take the typical leader, and you know is is not one that is admired widely or known widely as a, as a good leader. So we do have problems with leadership, but we have deep, deeper problems with followership. Our followers are not are very is over. They are overly vulnerable to be manipulated because they believe anything they see in their uh, screens through the internet. Because they don't pay attention. Because they, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody should become a politician. People have busy lives and struggling and everything else. But people need to pay a little more attention to. Who, what is being told, what is being promised, how can it be achieved, who to believe. The fight against post-truth has to be very important uh, mm. and, and make sure that people stop believing whatever comes through, through the internet. So the yes, we have a problem with, uh, with leaders, but we need to find ways to lower the vulnerability uh, of, uh, of, of, of believers. Mm. And I suppose leaders need to 
need to expose what is happening in civil society. Leaders in civil society, in business and elsewhere, in the churches, have a role to play. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the functions. We haven't talked about political parties and, uh, because, uh, but, you know, there is not such a thing as democracy of uh, non-governmental organizations or, or without political parties. We need political parties. But the political parties are in disrepute. They are not uh, attractive. If you ask a young person, an, an idealist that wants to change uh, her city or his world or make a, 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 make a change in the world, they will never think of going to political parties. They, they will rather join movements, uh, non-government organizations and the like. And, and, and political parties have lost uh, the capacity to attract, retain, and develop uh, political talent. They, they are no longer the home of the idealists and mm -hmm. are more the home of the opportunists, the careerists, the people that want to go in government to steal uh, and, and become rich by being in government or in, in, in the public sector. So um, we need to, to, to to bring back the political parties, either modernize them and change them or declare them intellectually, morally bankrupt and create new ones. Wow. Yes, I've always thought there were such important arenas for training people in, you know, internal democracy in political parties really matters to train people for wider society and democratic rules and processes and accepting when you lose. All those kinds of issues are being lost. That's the definition of uh, one of the functions that political parties perform. Uh, they have to train uh, the public servants and the government leaders that can tackle all these problems that we have. Um, mm. But uh, that's not, we don't find that uh, uh, around the world in a very impactful way. Mm. Mm. Well, Moises, I'm going to end our conversation now. Thank you so much for giving us this time and for sharing with us your views on such a range of, well, interesting, but not very, well, I'm, I'm hesitant to say depressing topics, but I think there is some hope in what you're saying, as well as a call to action to be alerted to what is going on and to stand up to that. So thank you very much for joining us at CDE Virtual. And it's been a, a real privilege to have you on our platform. Thank you very much, Annie. It was a pleasure. It was always great talking to you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.